grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller. I serve as pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in New Minden, Illinois, St. Luke's Covington, and at Trinity St. John Lutheran School, Nashville, Illinois. Thank you for tuning in to our Bible class. We pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without your help, our labor is useless, and without your light, our search is in vain. Invigorate our study of your Holy Word, that by due diligence and right discernment, we may be established by your Spirit in your holy faith, and be equipped to share it with others, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Last week we heard of Jesus' care for his little ones, that is, care for children, and we might also include those who are new to the faith or struggling in their faith. Let's get a running start for today's section by hearing again Matthew 18, verses 10 to 14. Jesus said, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. It's in this context that Jesus begins to give us instructions about what to do when our brother sins against us. And he accompanies his instructions with promises to be with us and to hear our prayers. With Christ's care for each of the little ones, now let us hear today's section, Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. If your brother sins against you, Jesus said, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Well, dear friends, imagine, if you would, a sniper of some sort seeking to kill you as you exit from church and make your way back to your car. He doesn't have a high-powered rifle or a firearm, but one of those blowguns like you see tribesmen in the movies. There he is, hiding behind the bushes or behind a car. He dips his dart into his flask of poison and sets his sights on you. And just when we come into view, he takes a big breath to shoot his arrow. Friends, that sniper is real. It's the devil himself, our great enemy and the enemy of Christ himself. He is sneaking around, scouting us out, and he seems to know exactly what sort of poison will be most deadly to us. He would like nothing better than to get his deadly dart under our skin so that the venom could do its work and poison us. I'm convinced that one of the most effective poisons he uses on seemingly strong Christians is when he stirs up conflict among us. Wherever there is peace and harmony, he would like nothing better than to inject the poison of bitterness, hatred, and the bearing of grudges. Left unchecked, this poison ruins souls, wrecks families, and has been known to damage or even destroy local congregations. 
when harmony is turned into discord, when affection is replaced by bitterness, when warm friendships are replaced by suspicion and plotting, then the devil has had his way with us, and the salvation of souls may even be in jeopardy. People who imagine that church members are on the other side may pull out of a church group that previously had built them up in the faith, or they might stop coming to church altogether, staying at home, sulking in the bitter stew of their hurt. Friends, it's all so unnecessary. The Lord Jesus, in his word, has given us clear instructions what to do when conflicts arise. If we would only believe his promises and follow his instructions, the damage from these poisonous darts would be entirely eliminated. We have some of the clear instructions right here in this text. Here we learn that the goal when conflict arises ought to be to gain our brother. That is, uppermost in our minds ought to be helping the person on the other side to keep his or her faith in Christ, or if they have lost their faith, to be used by God to restore them to faith. Jesus begins with the one-on-one -on -one conversation. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Does that mean that every time someone does something to irritate me, I need to meet privately with them? No, no. Elsewhere, the Lord says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4. The love of God covers over a multitude of our sins, and the love that we have for others ought to cover all of our neighbor's sins. This grace of God under which we live also controls how we deal with our neighbor. Husbands and wives and others who live and work in close proximity with each other daily overlook and forgive many little sins and irritations. What the Lord has in mind here are sins that are in danger of disrupting a relationship, one that is like a stone in your shoe that keeps bothering you. In that case, don't go complain to your neighbor. Go to the person directly. Even secular students of conflict resolution will tell you that direct face-to-face -face meeting of parties who are at war, that's far better than anything else to make peace. What if I don't have anything against my brother, but he seems to have something against me? Should I just wait for him to come to me? No. In another place, Jesus tells us that if someone has something against us, if we know that someone is holding something against us, whether it's real or imagined, we ought to first go and be reconciled with our brother before we come to the Lord's altar. That was in Matthew 5. In either case, whether we have been wronged or are the one the ones who have done the wrong, Jesus says, you go. And if we were all listening to the Lord, we would probably meet each other in the middle, each one on his way to speak with the other. Through the Apostle Paul, the Lord instructs us how to handle it. In Galatians 6, he says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Keep watch on yourself, the Lord says. Is there any pride in our hearts? Are we thinking of ourselves as, the, as better than the one who has hurt us? Are we going just to vent our own anger, or are we going in order to gain the other brother or sister? Are we ready to listen to something they may have against us, do we have any spiritual blind spots that are keeping us from seeing the truth about ourselves? But pastor, you may be saying, the person with whom I have conflict is not a Christian. Oh, they may have a, their names on the church roster, but the way they've carried on proves they're no Christian. They're not my brother, therefore I don't have to follow what the Lord says here. Well, I'd answer in two ways. First, be careful not to judge. Only God knows what is in a person's heart. It may be that they have kept the faith but are weak and need building up. Perhaps they simply have a blind spot to their own sin in a certain area, and they need to be helped to see it. 
Secondly, if you are right and there's no more faith, that's exactly the reason why you ought to go to them directly and privately in the kindest and gentlest way you possibly can. If he is no longer a Christian, he needs to be restored or gained for the Lord. Notice the Lord's promise. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. The very Son of God came down from heaven, put on flesh and blood, lived in a human family with all the opportunities for conflict that happened in the home, perfectly loved his neighbor in word and deed as our substitute, gave himself fully to the horrible death prescribed for him in order to suffer hell that our sins deserved. And now risen from the dead, this Savior himself is in the midst of us whenever we are gathered to work on these things. If you call on the name of Jesus when you go to talk over these personal matters with someone, the Lord Jesus will indeed be present to help and to bless. After all, you and I cannot really gain our brother back from death. The Lord himself must do that. It's the power of the Holy Spirit alone that creates faith. Well, what if the personal conversation doesn't work? Jesus urges us to gain our brother through a team effort. He says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Jesus knows that we will need help with this at times. Perhaps we are so emotionally involved that we can't see past the hurt. He says to bring along someone to help, someone who can look at things objectively. Perhaps we can't seem to communicate very well with this person. Find someone who can. Perhaps there's a wise, godly man or woman in the family or the neighborhood who will listen to both sides of the conflict and be willing to prayerfully and with humility make suggestions to one or both parties that will break the logjam and lead to peace. The Apostle Paul used this approach with regard to two workers in the church at Philippi who were engaged in conflict. In chapter 4 of Philippians, he says, I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, apparently he's addressing the pastor, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel. The beginning of Philippians is unique in that the overseers and deacons, that is the pastor and the, the leaders in the church, are specifically mentioned as those to whom the letter is addressed. They are asked by Paul to help these women to make peace. Faithful women in the Lord who somehow had a falling out. Your pastor is ready and willing to help if you want him to be that one that you take along to bring about a reconciliation. Notice that the Lord does not say, but if he does not listen, take him to court. Turning to Paul once more, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we have a very pointed warning against a Christian going to law against another. There it says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? The Lord teaches us that such grievances among Christian brothers and sisters should rather be laid before fellow saints. We are told that Christians will judge the world as partners with Christ when he returns in glory, sitting on the throne with him, we will also have a hand in the judgment. Every earthly dispute is trivial by comparison. How would this work today? My suggestion is that the conflict between two Christians could be brought before a Christian reconciliation panel. We would find wise and godly Christians perhaps from outside our community, people who could listen impartially and prayerfully and be ready to help, meeting with the conflicted parties in complete confidentiality. Their purpose would be not to impose their own solution on the two sides, but to help them reconcile directly one with the other. There are even people with specialized training in this area. Under the blessing of God, this type of approach can accomplish great things. 
and thousands of dollars in legal fees can be saved. Once again, the purpose here is that the brother be gained. The good shepherd wants none to be lost. Such a panel would encourage confession and absolution where necessary. And you can believe the Lord's promise that forgiveness pronounced on earth is forgiveness that counts in heaven. For he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, the guilt that you untie, the sins that you forgive on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The absolution pronounced to penitent sinners does absolve or untie or loosen the burden of guilt from sinners. This approach is much more effective than the court system, which by definition is set up to create adversaries. Every case has that little word versus in it, so-and-so versus so-and-so. The courts are going to pit you against someone else, someone who may be a brother in the faith. Paul says that's already a defeat. If we have the heart of Christ, we would rather gain our brother than keep the farm. For the sake of our witness to the world, the love of Christ enables us to suffer loss rather than create a stumbling block to those outside the faith. And friends, I have seen this. People willing to set aside their claim to thousands of dollars worth of property rather than create a conflict in the body of Christ. They are willing quietly to give up their claim, perhaps a claim that would be very legitimate in worldly courts, but they give it up in order to avoid a split in the family and to keep the brother from being lost from Christ and from that relationship. It's a beautiful thing, a moving thing, a Christ-like thing. It happens in Christian families and in Christian congregations where the love of Christ is controlling people. Now, Jesus then mentions gaining your brother through the ministry of the local church. If all these steps fail and fail repeatedly, then there may have to come a point when the congregation gets involved. And here again, the congregation will conduct itself in such a way so that everything is done with the purpose in mind of gaining the person back. The most drastic step is excommunication, whereby the Lord says they become as a Gentile and a tax collector. Such were not allowed in the fellowship in the temple, but the Lord Jesus still loved them and spent time with them, calling them to repentance. Thus the congregation, in sadness and motivated only by love, may have to say to someone, by being openly unrepentant, you have displayed that you are not a Christian. We are all sinners, and we daily need Christ's forgiveness, but you have stubbornly and persistently refused to receive that forgiveness. By striking their names from the membership roll, we are warning them that unless they repent, they may be stricken from the book of life when the Lord returns. We want to make an impression on them now so they would indeed turn away from their sins now before it's too late. And when they do repent, the brother is gained, restored. See 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul instructs the church at Corinth to excommunicate a man who was brazenly taking his stepmother as his own wife. And see also 2 Corinthians 2, the follow-up letter, where Paul instructs the church to welcome back such a person who has come to repentance. Let's pause for a hymn called, Chief of Sinners Though I Be, Jesus Shed His Blood for Me, as sung earlier this year by students and professors gathered for the daily chapel service at the Lutheran Theological College in Uganda.
Friends, in this day and age, conflict is more and more a problem. I just heard a talk show the other day on a popular radio station where the topic was cutting people out of your life, just simply making a decision to have nothing more to do with certain family members or friends who are difficult. Surely, in the vast majority of these situations, there's a better way. Before we end today, I'd like to recommend a couple of resources about biblical peacemaking. The first is an organization called Ambassadors of Reconciliation. You can find them on the internet at aorhope.org. They have tons of resources, including books and all different kinds of free downloads. If you're struggling with conflict in your personal life or your church, you might even want to give them a call and talk to one of their representatives. That's A-O-R-H-O-P-E dot O-R-G. Secondly, I recommend a book by Ken Sandy, that's S-A-N-D-E, called The Peacemaker, a biblical guide to resolving personal conflict, third edition published in 2004 by Baker Books. And here's a little bit of what Ken has to say in this book about this passage we've been studying and how it fits in with other scriptures on this topic. He says, when Christians think about talking to someone else about a conflict, one of the first verses that comes to mind is Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If this verse is read in isolation, it seems to teach that we must always use direct confrontation to force others to admit they have sinned. If the verse is read in context, however, we see that Jesus had something much more flexible and beneficial in mind than simply standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with others and describing their sins. Just before this passage, we find Jesus' wonderful metaphor of a loving shepherd who goes out to look for a wandering sheep and then rejoices when it is found. Thus, Matthew 18.15 is introduced with a theme of restoration, not condemnation. Jesus repeats this theme just after telling us to go and show him his fault by adding, if he listens to you, you have won your brother over. And then he hits the restoration theme a third time later in the chapter in verses 21 to 35, where he uses the parable of the unmerciful servant to remind us to be as merciful and forgiving to others as God is to us. Jesus is clearly calling for something much more loving and redemptive than simply confronting others with a list of their wrongs. He wants us to remember and imitate his shepherd love for us, to seek after others to help them turn from sin and to be restored to God and those who have offended. This restoration theme is echoed throughout the scripture as we are urged to help, restore, save, and forgive those who are caught in sin. See 1 Thessalonians 5, Galatians 6, which we heard in James 5.20. Although this restoration process may sometimes require direct confrontation, the Bible teaches that there are often better ways to approach people regarding their wrongs. In fact, Scripture rarely uses words we would translate as confront to describe the process of talking to others about their faults. Instead, it calls us to use a wide spectrum of activities to minister to others, including confessing, teaching, instructing, reasoning with, showing, encouraging, correcting, warning, admonishing, or rebuking. God wants us to adjust the intensity of our communication to fit the other person's position and urgency of the situation. We are also warned not to let disagreements with others degenerate into quarreling, arguing, or foolish controversies. Clearly, there is more to restoring others than simply confronting them with their wrongs. Therefore, if we want to be effective as peacemakers, we need to ask God to help us be discerning and flexible so that we can use whatever approach will be most effective in a given situation. And there are many scripture references that Sandy uses in this section and many more helpful details in his teaching. But that's all the time we have here. I heartily recommend the book, The Peacemaker by Ken Sandy, S-A-N-D-E. 
Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer, led in song by the children from Trinity St. John Lutheran School, accompanied by Mrs. Janice Lange. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, Illinois. This is Pastor Tim Miller. Please join us next Sunday, God willing, as we continue our study of Matthew. If you don't have a church home, we invite you to join us sinners at St. John's where the gifts of Christ's forgiveness and salvation are offered every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And are you at odds with loved ones over politics? You might invite them to join you at Prayers for America in Word and Song, Sunday, October 13th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon at St. John's, New Minden. This is a nonpartisan worship service. We'll celebrate the eternal kingdom which Christ has given us, even as we pray for this land where he has placed us to serve our neighbor. The Southern Illinois District President, Tim Schar from the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, he'll give the message, and Mrs. Karen Shimkus will be at the organ for lots of singing. The service will be preceded by a half hour of chamber music by Karen Shimkus and friends in the St. John's Memorial Chapel, beginning at 2.30. A portion of the offering will support the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty, which serves as the presence of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in Washington, D.C. This morning we thank our sponsor, and there's still a few openings to sponsor a broadcast before the end of the year. If you'd like to help, please let us know. We also thank our good partners at V1047, who put us on the air every week. They are the best, and thank you for listening.